morning. It is Wednesday, September 9th from CBC News. I'm Nina. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to just ask everyone to, uh, I'm going to mute all. Perfect. Chris, I'm going to unmute you. Perfect. All right. Well, everyone, welcome uh, to, I guess this is our first official start. Last year, we kind of got started during the pandemic uh, with these weekly rounds. And uh, I think we had uh, a fair amount of success uh, with this platform. Uh, we had speakers from across, we had attendees from across the province, which was wonderful. And I'm hoping to continue that momentum going forward into this new academic year. Um, it is a uh, it is it is a it is a great opportunity I think for us to present a, a wide variety of topics that are not specific necessarily to cardiac surgery but also to cardiology as a whole. These are really meant to be NB Heart Center CV rounds, uh, and not specifically cardiac surgery rounds. So I would uh, I would hope that we can get as much participation from across the heart center as is possible, as well as from a, from across the province in terms of internists and cardiologists and maybe even family doctors at some point. So this is once again, a, this is a, a set of rounds that's being delivered to everyone. Uh, I would also ask that if anybody has any ideas that they would like to see presented, uh, any topics, any, pres any presenters, uh, please feel free to come forward. There's no topic that isn't a good one that we can't roll into a, a good session. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Chris White, uh, who is now, I guess, celebrating the one year anniversary of his uh, joining our division. Uh, he comes from, originally comes from out west. Uh, he did his training both in Winnipeg and in Edmonton and did a fellowship at Duke in, in, in heart failure surgery and mechanical circulatory support and really has helped to uh, not only engage the heart failure program here in St. John, but also really uh, bring our mechanic, mechanical circulatory support program to the next level. Um, so with this in mind, uh, Chris wanted to present uh, a cardiogenic shock, uh, cardiogenic shock primer, to say the least, uh, a kind of an ABCs of cardiogenic shock, and I'll pass the torch over to him. Perfect, thanks, Ansar, for, um, for the introduction. Uh, so as, as he mentioned, the goal of this talk is really to provide uh, an overview of the identification and management of cardiogenic shock uh, to be applicable really at a basic level in the CCU um, or wherever you might encounter these patients. So um, I wanted to start with a case presentation. Uh, this is of a 44-year-old female who uh, presents to the emergency room in St. John with confusion. Uh, she gets a CT scan of her head uh, to uh, investigate that, which is normal. Um, and her vital signs are, as you see there, heart rate of 50, blood pressure of 100 over 50, 94% on room air. They do a, a blood gas just from a, a, a peripheral vein that shows a pH of 7.25 and a lactate of 9. Um, and she's has a cardiology consult really because of her ECG, which shows complete heart block, which you can see here. So Dr. Buick sees her in, in the emergency department and puts an ultrasound probe on her chest and sees severe biventricular dysfunction. So first question is, is this patient in cardiogenic shock? Um, and so we'll get back to this case at the end of the talk, but a few points that I wanted to get through in the next 20 or 25 minutes is, First, what is cardiogenic shock? How do you identify it and how do you treat it? So shock, the definition of shock really is insufficient oxygen supply to meet the demands of the body. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about this over the next 20 minutes, but um, that is really the take home point is shock is not enough oxygen getting to the end organs uh, to meet demands. Now this can be broken down into a number of different subtypes of shock. Uh, the one we're going to be focusing on predominantly today is cardiogenic shock. So on the x-axis here you see pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or some metric of preload and then on the y-axis is some metric of cardiac index, cardiac output or how much volume the blood is pumping around the body. So in cardiogenic shock in general these patients are full so they have a wedge pressure, greater, full, greater, so they have a wedge pressure. greater than 18. Um, and a cardiac index less than 2.2. So these are the, the vast majority of patients that we're going to be talking about. Um, we won't focus on the, on the other forms of, of shock today. 
So the classic definition of cardiogenic shock uh, that is used in a lot of the shock trials that have been done to date is you have some degree of hypotension and some degree of end organ hypoperfusion, which is identified based on a lactate level or clinical exams of so cold extremities, confusion, uh, inadequate urine output. The problem with this definition is it's a very broad umbrella term. It encompasses patients who have a mild degree of shock who maybe just need a vasopressor for, um, or an anotrope for a short period of time and recover. And it also encompasses the opposite end of the spectrum, the patients who are in critical shock uh, and will lose their life in a matter of hours if rapid intervention isn't undertaken. So a new categorization of, of the shock patient has entered the research and clinical arena. I don't want to spend a great deal of time on this, just wanted to highlight that this new categorization of shock has really been brought into play to highlight that broad spectrum of patient and that one shock patient might need a very different degree of intervention than the other. So how do we identify shock? Um, you know, the clinical exam is obviously the first first thing we look at. And I just put in bold here the things that I put the most stock in, um, and that is of, you know, cold extremities, confusion or agitation, and, and poor urine output. Biochemical markers, the things I put the most stock in are their mixed venous oxygen saturation and their lactate. And then hemodynamics provide a great deal of information, and this is something we'll highlight over the course of the talk, but um, a Swan-Gans catheter uh, provides a great deal of information in terms of the degree of shock and then response to therapy. Uh, but other things we can look at are LVDP in the cath lab, um, and then what degree of vasoactive support they're requiring. So this vasoactive infusion score is a, you know, tries to objectify uh, the degree of, of vasoactive su the support they're on and as a corollary, the degree of shock that they're in. So I just wanted to put this table up to highlight a few of the numbers. So if you look over here at the patients in severe shock, they are hypotensive, they're tachycardic, they have cold extremities, they have a lactate greater than four and a cardiac index less than one and a half, um, a LVDP or wedge pressure greater than 30, and then a vasoactive infusion score greater than 30. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight what that score is, and you don't need to memorize this, um, but I just wanted to point out that if you're on norepinephrine 0 0.3 mics per kilo per minute, you have a vasoactive infusion score of 30 and you're in severe shock. So if you have drug uh, doses that are greater than this, that patient is in big trouble despite what their blood pressure might look like. So then getting into treatment. So if we said that shock is inadequate oxygen supply to meet the demands of the body, the first way we can Im improve their shock state is to improve their oxygen supply. And that really is focusing on oxygen delivery to every organ in the body. We often get focused on the heart in these kind of patients, but you have to view this as a systemic problem. So everything comes down to oxygen delivery. So the truck is the cardiac output, how much blood is getting pumped around the body. And then the next part of the equation is how much oxygen uh, is, that, is that stroke volume or cardiac output carrying. I want to emphasize again that blood pressure does not equal oxygen delivery. So if you have a normal blood pressure, that really doesn't mean very much. Blood pressure is cardiac output times your systemic vascular resistance. So you can drive up your systemic vascular resistance to an extremely high number and still have a blood pressure that might make you feel comfortable, but it's at the expense of a profoundly depressed cardiac output, and you can still have a patient in profound shock despite a normal blood pressure. So everything about shock treatment is about oxygen delivery. And conveniently, there's an equation that describes oxygen delivery. So that is cardiac output times your oxygen content. Now, don't be overwhelmed by this long equation. It really is broken down to your hemoglobin concentration and your percent saturation are the variables that matter here times your cardiac output. So we'll go through this uh, step by step. And I wanna do this because it really highlights then an algorithm or an ABC approach to what you can optimize in the treatment of a shock patient. So we'll talk first about cardiac output. Cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. 
So if you think about heart rate, which is the first component of that equation, what we can optimize is heart rate and rhythm. Uh, so we can cardiovert or defibrillate a patient that it might be in, in rapid AFib or some other type of malignant arrhythmia. We can give them amiodarone or lidocaine to help that process. If they're slow, we can pace them. And then there are other, also drugs that we can use to treat or optimize uh, their heart rate. A recent patient um, that was being cooled in the CCU where they were quite bradycardic and their heart rate was not helping us in terms of their shock management state. Um, and they were being cooled, we actually liberalized our targeted temperature management to bring their heart rate up and improve their, their cardiac output and oxygen delivery. So heart rate and rhythm is the first variable we can optimize. The next is stroke volume. So stroke volume is impacted by preload, afterload, and cardiac contractility. Um, and so talking first about preload, everyone's heard of the Frank Starling curve. So that really just describes the relationship between stroke volume and some metric of preload. So as you fill the heart more, you improve their stroke volume and therefore their cardiac output. So we want these shock patients to be running up in this top part of the Frank Starling curve, meaning we've optimized their stroke volume as best we can. Um, so metrics of preload, we can look at our CVP, their wedge pressure, their PA diastolic pressure on a swung gans catheter, their LVDP in the cath lab. Um, and if we're giving volume, I would encourage um, you to avoid saline, which we can talk about later, um, and use colloids. And especially if their hemoglobin is less than 100, use blood. And we'll get to that later uh, in, the, in, the, in the talk. Uh, but we want these patients to be uh, not empty. Um, and in general, shock will kill a patient quicker than pulmonary edema will. So we tend to run these patients on the full side. Just keep in mind that th these are different Frank Sterling curves depending on uh, what kind of heart you're dealing with. So you can see that as we fill hearts, the bang for your buck becomes less in sick hearts that have heart failure or patients that have profound myocardial depression. The next variable we can optimize is afterload. Um, so this is the next variable that impacts the stroke volume component of the equation. Um, so these are our different Frank Starling curves at different afterloads. You can see that um, as you drive your afterload up, it depresses the Frank Starling curve. So you get less bang for your buck uh, with LV filling in terms of stroke volume. So we, we don't want their afterload too high or too low. We want it sitting somewhere in the middle because what you're really balancing is stroke volume. So allowing the heart to eject with perfusion pressure. So we don't want a map of 45, but we also don't want a map of 95. So in order to optimize that, we use vasoactive agents and really target a map somewhere in the 65 to 70 range. And in the shock patient, I would encourage you to avoid pure vasoconstrictors. So if someone is very hypertensive, you actually might want to use vasodilators. If they're profoundly vasodilated, then we can minimize their sedation to help spare some vasoactive agent. So, you know, typically patients need in the range of 25 or 30 of propofol, not 80. Um, we correct their pH. So profoundly acidotic patients become very vasodilated. In the extreme circumstance, we can use drugs like methylene blue or cyanokit to improve vasoplegia. And if you're struggling from an RV failure perspective, we can consider drugs like inhaled nitric oxide. Then the last variable impacting stroke volume is cardiac contractility. And I lump in with this also mechanical support options. So this is trying to improve uh, the squeeze of the heart. So as we increase our cardiac contractility with inotropes, we shift our Frank Starling curve up and we get more bang for our buck in terms of LV filling. Uh, and so that's what we're aiming to achieve with inotropes and mechanical support options. So other things we can do to correct or improve our cardiac contractility is check and ionize calcium. If, it less, if it's less than 1.2, correct that. Also again, correct the pH. So acidotic patients do not respond to endogenous and exogenous inotropes. Um, then give them an IV inotropic agent. And then our, we get into our mechanical support options. So the very mild end of the spectrum of NCS options is a balloon pump. 
And then we can get into more advanced forms of mechanical support, ECMO, Impella, Central VADS, and things like that. So when we get back to this oxygen delivery equation, we've looked at all the things in the cardiac output component of the equation. The next component is in the oxygen content component of the equation. Um, and we can ignore this part of the equation and all we really have to focus on is their hemoglobin and their percent saturation. So I just wanna highlight this component of the equation to say that if your patient has a hemoglobin less than 100 and you think they have room for volume, give them blood over other intravenous agents. So we aim for a hemoglobin above 100 and an oxygen saturation above 96% because this is a very easy way to improve our oxygen delivery in a heart that's struggling is to improve how much oxygen that blood's able to carry. So if we get back to our shock equation, which we said is inadequate oxygen supply to meet demand, We've done what we can do to optimize their oxygen supply. Then there's a few very simple things we can do to decrease their demand. So if they're awake and have increased work of breathing, we can intubate and sedate them, uh, which will minimize how much oxygen they're consuming. And similarly, if they're agitated or have a degree of sepsis, we can treat those things to minimize their oxygen demand. So when you summarize all this, I know that was a lot of information, but when you actually break it down, this is the algorithm that I use to evaluate any shock patient to make sure we're doing everything we can to treat their shock state, and then likewise decide if they need advanced mechanical options. So if we've optimized their rate and rhythm, which is you can pace a patient, you can shock them, and you can give them antiarrhythmic agents. If their preload is where we want it, so say a CVP in the you know, 10 to 12 range, an LVDP in the, or a wedge pressure in the 18 range, 15 range. If we've given them fluid and blood to optimize their preload, then we've done what we can, we can from, a, um, uh, from a fluid perspective. And then afterload, so I limit their, their vasodilating agents, correct their acidosis, and then give um, inotropes or vasodilators, depending what their blood pressure is and aiming for a, a map in the 65 to 70 range. Then cardiac contractility, correct their calcium, give them inotropes. And if their cardiac index and SVO2 and lactate are inadequate with that, then consider mechanical support options. Um, and then last but not least, we can give them blood, optimize their oxygen saturation uh, to optimize their oxygen content. We all are familiar with the time equals myocardium um, concept in terms of patients with acute MI. It's the exact same thing with the shock patient, except it is time equals end organs. So there needs to be an urgency in terms of identifying and treating shock patients. Um, and you know, I use this rolling rock theory to emphasize that. So if you have a patient um, in shock and they are at risk of falling off this cliff, the rock size is their age, comorbidities, and frailty. And then where they sit on this cliff is a representation of the magnitude of insult and duration of it. So the further they are down this cliff, the harder it is to pull them back up. Um, and so uh, we need to get these patients early um, and, and intervene early in terms of trying to pull them back up this cliff. And the older they are and more frail they are, the last they, were to, they will tolerate the insult. So getting back to our patient, um, they put a catheter in, in, in the uh, emergency department and she had minimal urine output on clinical exam. She was cold and clammy from her knees down. We got a formal echo which confirmed severe biventricular dysfunction, but normal valvular function. Uh, and we went to the cath lab and she had normal coronary arteries. So is this patient in shock? So we have a patient who is clinically oliguric, is cold and clammy, uh, and she has a venous lactate of nine for whatever that's worth, um, but she's normotensive on room air and awake. Um, so you could argue that she has some discordant clinical uh, uh, variables that make the picture a little bit confusing. So we decided to put a Swan-Gans catheter in, in the cath lab and we found an SVO2 of 38%, which was severely reduced, and a cardiac index of 1.3, which if you remember from that chart we showed earlier, is in severe shock. 
So now what? If we go through our algorithm, auction supply, in terms of the first component of that algorithm, rate and rhythm, she's in complete heart block with a heart rate of 50. So we put in a transvenous pacer and paced her at 80. Preload, her CVP was 10, her PA diastolic pressure on cath was 18. So we didn't give her any fluids, fluids but we didn't give her any Lasix either. After load, she had a blood pressure of 100 over 54, which actually is pretty much perfect. So we didn't give her any vasodilators. Cardiac contractility, we saw a profoundly depressed um, cardiac index with severe bivy dysfunction on echo. So we started some inotropes and put it in a balloon pump. Her hemoglobin was 135, so we didn't give her any blood, but she was 92% on room air, so we gave her some nasal cannula. And then in terms of the oxygen demand side of the equation, uh, we did not do anything from an intubation perspective because she was awake and mentating reasonably well. So if you then reevaluate all these numbers after our interventions, her cardiac index came up to 3.1 from 1.3, and her SVO2 came up to 62% from 38%. Um, so I hope this is provides some type of a framework to approach these shock patients. Every patient is different, but if you approach it with that algorithm, then you know you're um, intervening on every avenue that you're able to. And if that is insufficient, then we get into the MCS options. But this is, you know, I think a very basic algorithm that can be used in every patient, whether it's in the CCU emergency department or ICU uh, after surgery. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Chris, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, a quick question for you uh, before I open it up to the floor. And obviously, I would ask people that they can they can unmute themselves and ask questions, and or they can use the chat function if they so uh, if they so wish. Uh, first question is from JF. Uh, the patient example you had. Could you comment on the frequency of reevaluation? Yeah, very good question. I think these patients are patients that require you to be in the in the patient's room at the bedside initially in terms of determining what what trajectory that patient is going to end up on. This is something that requires reevaluation in the 30 to 60 minute range. This is check a calcium, replace it, uh, check a mixed venous gas and arterial gas and a cardiac index. Do your interventions that you're able to do and then reevaluate. Because if after a couple rounds of this, so say in the you know, 30, 60, 90 minute range, it's clear that we're losing, then we would intervene and escalate their therapy immediately. Um, and so I would say the decisions early on in these shock patients are made in the first one to three hours. Um, occasionally, if you're making slow gains and you think you might get away without ECMO, for example, then you might stretch that out into the six to eight or 12 hour range. Uh, but initially, these are patients that require reevaluation in, you know, in the 30 to 60 minute range. Next question is, um, so obviously we've talked a little bit about our approach here at the Heart Center uh, in terms of cardiogenic shock patients. What about some of our atten attendees who are out in the periphery? Um, what would you, their approach should be? Obviously, you know, in the time equals myocardium spectrum of things, uh, they, they are hindered by the fact that they're not actually here at the heart center. So they've lost some of that time. But mm -hmm. what information can they provide us? And in what kind of a time frame can they provide that to us so that we can make the best decisions possible for that patient? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's, I think it's, it's a, uh, they have a much more difficult job than, than we do and because you know, they see a broad spectrum of patients and are trying to identify those in real trouble that need to be transferred down early. Uh, but I think the very basic things are what, what uh, which I'm sure already what are being done are what is the information we need. They need a Foley catheter. They need uh, you know, an art line and central line to check arterial and venous gases. Um, and, and then uh, you know, a, a bedside ultrasound or echo. And, and those things provide a wealth of information um, if they, if you have a patient who is on a high dose of a vasoactive drug, are not peeing, have a lactate, a low mixed venous oxygen saturation, that's really all the information uh, that is required to know that that patient is in trouble and is going to need further further therapy, albeit in the mechanical support spectrum. Um, and so, um, the the I think the 
the key is identifying the patient at risk and getting the monitoring lines in, Foley catheters in, and getting blood gas results back um, early and identifying those patients in trouble early and then initiating the, the pathway to get them transferred down. Chris, there's a, a question here from Colin, and I think it kind of speaks a little bit to sometimes the, you know, how much do you do for certain patient populations? Obviously, we get asked all the time in the surgical world, you know, why are we operating on this 80-year-old? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, at what point do we not offer surgery to somebody based on age or frailty? Uh, the same thing goes even for the initiation of mechanical circulatory support. At which point is it too late? And are, or are we uh, sometimes, you know, I guess for lack of a better term, flogging a dead horse? Uh, the question specifically from Colin is, uh, could you comment on shock management and outcomes in elderly patients, and by that, you know, over the age of 70, over the age of 75, over the age of 80. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I can't give you numbers specific to, you know, the 70, 80, 90 population. Without a doubt, uh, age is a big variable in terms of how aggressive we are with these patients. And also the flip side is, to what degree of insult will that patient endure and still have a chance of survival? So a very dire, um, situation with profound prolonged shock where things look hopeless. Uh, if that patient is 30 or 40 years old, uh, will be aggressive, you know, almost regardless. Um, patients that are 70 plus, even 65 plus, I think we, we think a lot harder about, about the concept of ECMO or advanced MCS. Um, if they're, you know, that being said, these age numbers are not hard cutoffs. If you have a really good um, uh, protoplasm despite advanced age and you think you have a reasonable chance of recovering that patient, we might still consider it. But the reason for those age cutoffs is once you're above that 65, 70 range, if you cannot recover that patient, then you don't have a durable VAD transplant out. Uh, and then you're stuck on MCS with no exit strategy. So that's kind of where that 65, 70 age range cutoff comes from in terms of how aggressive we're willing to be um, because you don't have an exit strategy anymore. Uh, you know, in general, the shock outcomes, despite, you know, all the advances over the last 10, 20 years, the mortality is still 50%. Uh, and that's for all comers. And if you're 70, 80 plus, that number just, you know, I would say declines rapidly. So, um, you know, the, you know, the aggressiveness um, in an 80 year old in shock, you know, we're not going to put that patient on ECMO, though, you know, would still can consider putting in a, a balloon pump and inotropes um, if they, if we feel there's a reasonable chance of recovering them. But without a doubt, to try and answer your question, the older that patient is and the more comorbidities they have, uh, the more difficult it is to recover those patients in the shock scenario. Last question, Chris, um, kind of along the lines of your rolling rock annual uh, analogy, uh, is there, irrespective of age, is there something that kind of tells you, you know, that, you know, it's too late? Um, you know, is there any particular marker that you use to kind of say, you know what, at this point, any further intervention and or management is futile versus, you know, let's give it a shot because we still have time? Yeah, I think that, you know, depends a little bit on the patient in front of you. Um, again, if there's a 30 or 40 year old patient, I think, Regardless, I would try in those patients, um, even if all the numbers point to near futility. Um, but the big things I would say are, are whether they've had an arrest or not and the duration of that. So if someone has had a prolonged downtime um, uh, in an older patient, then that is something to consider strongly, particularly if it was an unwitnessed arrest. Um, I would say your your blood gas. So if you have a, you know, a pH in the, you know, well less than seven range, if you have someone who has a pH in the, you know, 6.8 range, for example, 6.7 range, uh, 6.9 range, then, you know, that becomes a very difficult metabolic si uh, situation to reverse. Um, and then other thing, you know, lactate um, uh, and, and vasoactive dose but I would say the bigger thing also is the duration of that insult is a, is a big variable. But there isn't one thing uh, 
one number necessarily that would would deter me from pursuing. It's really the whole package with the patient, their age, comorbidities, and their story that that I think goes into the decisions of whether we offer advanced MCS or not. Absolutely, and I think I've seen that here where you know a 40 year old will tolerate a lactate of 11 or 12 if we know that there may be a chance to salvage versus somebody who's been, you know, under for quite a while with a lactate of 15. So, you know, obviously yeah. things, things are different from case to case. Yeah. Uh, Chris, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, hopefully this has been helpful. I'm going to hopefully have recorded this and uh, put it up on our YouTube channel. I will send the link out when I send out the invite for next week. Uh, thank you to everyone for your for attending. And as I said, uh, an invite for next week will come out with the topic at hand as still under under decision at this point in time. But uh, once again, great rounds. And uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you.